I am pleased to have back with us on the show today Pra Pandit, who is our British born Phalang monk. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be back. Always glad to be back. Anytime I think you I, come on the show, Greg and I have a headache after. I just can say, I think I might even learn more from Propandit than I do from Ricker. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ricker is our language Jedi and Pandit is our life Jedi. Nice. I think you should be your title, Life Jedi. Life Jedi. Life Jedi. I can do language. You can do language. I can do Thai. Well, on today's show, I thought we would talk about some of the more controversial topics that affect uh, many other religions. Um, first, I wanted to ask you, though, is Buddhism a religion? Hey, you have to define religion. Oh, mm. man. <laughs> um, no, uh, Christianity. If we say a, a theistic religion, then no, because there's no supreme control in God. Right. So it's not a theistic religion, either polytheistic or monotheistic. It's well, not. I'm looking at the dictionary right now. It says the religion is defined as the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal god or gods. Well, I think Obama is a superhuman controlling power that people believe in. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> As so is Charlie it's a, Sheen. It's a little, un, a little unclear. Now, I would argue that within Buddhism you have enlightenment, which is the ultimate goal. It's the summum bonum of existence, summum bonum of philosophy, the highest good. And it enables people to attain to that. So in that sense, it being a passage or a teaching to take you to the highest good, then I'd say, yes, it is a religion. You could also call it a psychology. Okay. But not in a religion uh, similar to Christianity or Islam. Well, it's similar in many ways, and then other ways not similar. The, the, the crucial point is there isn't a monotheistic god as an overlord of the universe within Buddhism. Everything, including gods, all has to fall underneath natural law within Buddhism. Where do, where do the teachings of Buddhism come from? Is it, is it one person? So yeah, that was Siddhartha Gautama. He was uh, an Indian 2,500 years ago. And he attained to uh, something, whatever that is. He called it the Amata, the deathless, or the unconditioned, or the goal. Or he used many different words for it. He attained to this thing in meditation and then taught many people afterwards. And those then became the teachings, the suttas. Then after the suttas came many layers of Buddhists and Buddhisms, and then Buddhism went around the world and split into different areas. Not a lot of people know this, but Siddhartha Gautama yes. was actually played by Keanu Reeves in Little Buddha, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If that's a mind-blowing casting decision for you, I don't know what else is. He was the one who played God in Jim Carrey movie. Oh, uh, that was Morgan, Morgan Freeman. Freeman. Morgan Freeman, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. I would wager that Morgan Freeman has a bit more gravitas than Keanu Reeves when it comes to playing deities. Uh, you know, although he wasn't a deity. I understand. I made a mistake. Don't write emails and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you said that the teachings started 2,500 years ago. Um, if there's no one central figure like there is in Christianity, can anybody contribute to the teachings? Is it kind of like Wikipedia, where anyone can edit an article and say, hey, I, I figured this out? Well, historically, we have the documents there, so no, you can't re-edit or change them. So the original body of teachings is there. This is called the Pali Canon, and it's quite large. However, the interpretations of that then can vary. Same with the Bible or anything else. Whenever you've got something written down, afterwards people argue, what was actually meant by this particular word. Right, right. So the interpretations can vary a lot, yeah. And that's, I think, where in the, 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 a lot of the problems with the religion lies, is that it can be interpreted in a nearly infinite amount of ways, and depending yeah. on the or you know alignment of the person doing the interpretation, whether they're chaotic neutral or chaotic evil or whatever, Dungeons and Dragons definition you want to use, that's where it becomes confusing and flies off the rails, potentially. Yeah. I got that quasi argument on Twitter a while back, that lady claiming that the Bible is teachings of God and it's the absolute word. 
And I'm always amused by people who claim that because they, to me, they've never played that game in, in kindergarten where you all sit in a circle and the teacher whispers something in the first kid's ear. The telephone everybody game. Everybody whispers it all around. And it's completely different when it gets to the last kid. Chinese whispers, we called it. Right. Well, yeah, yeah we call it telephone game. Right. And, yeah. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't occur to these people that, hey, if, if someone taught something 2,000 years ago, it might have changed a little bit in the last few thousand years. Okay, so now we're on to the question of record keeping. Hmm. And there are several different forms of record keeping. One form of record keeping is storytelling. So you use stories as a useful and a handy way to transmit some iota of wisdom. And this is very, very effective. And the Hebraic religion had a very sophisticated storytelling methodology. And also the Aryan people who came down from the steppes of Russia and they spread across Europe. They took their storytelling to, uh, to India, to the Roman civilization, to the Greeks, to the Celts, to the Scandinavians. All of these came from this nomadic tribe, Aryan people, who told stories. And one of the stories they told was about a summon bonum, or a, a thing that doesn't die, the, called the amateur or the deathless. And it had two qualities, it doesn't die, and it's always providing. So stories like the Horn of Plenty, which you may have heard of, or the Holy Grail, a lot of the Holy Grail stories, were all about this very idea. And the Buddha also had heard these stories. This is what he went in search of for his life, because he'd heard that there was something outside of the normal scope of being a human being. Now, storytelling is one way to keep records. Another way of keeping records is to write them down. And you can engrave them on stone, which is obviously very effective and long-lasting, but rather difficult, because you need a vast area of flat stone to engrave your story on. Another way is to write them down onto leaves, onto banana leaves and papyrus and different things like this. But when you've written things down, firstly, only people who are learned can read them. Secondly, they can be destroyed by fire, flood, ants, insects, mildew, etc. So this was considered in India a poor form of record keeping. The most effective form of record keeping is chanting. And when you chant something, you learn it by heart, you formulate the teaching into a re repetitive formula. So you, you, you've made a bit of a change from the original. Then you get together in groups and each group will recite certain chants. So the scriptures were split up into sections and one person would learn a section of 10 chants. Once he's learned that and he's fluent in it, they would meet up every couple of weeks and they would recite their own chants to the other chanting groups. Now there's two advantages for this. The main advantage is if you make a mistake when you're chanting, you hear yourself out of sync with the other people, so you correct yourself. If you're writing down and you make a mistake, your written mistake gets copied into every subsequent copy. I see. And so the chanting was actually considered to be a far superior form of record. Wow. And also, it's very difficult to change a chant because if you've got 5,000 people have learnt your chant, who is going to change the chant? You'd have to retrain all those thousands of people. So it was considered a very powerful way to keep the actual original teaching intact without changing it. That's really interesting. And how it, is, it sounds it's so similar to just storytelling, but it's... It does, but storytelling will change. Every time you tell a story, it changes. Every time you do the chant, it's always exactly it's the It's like same. crowdsourcing the story mm. almost. I mean. So even today, you have a lot of people who can memorize vast amounts of this Pali chanting. I mean, I personally, I've memorized about three hours I could do by memory of pure Pali chants. And I don't even know Pali that well, so I can't tell you the meaning even, but I can do a good three hours of chanting. So it is actually a very effective form. Now, this was also known to the Greeks, and there was one Greek man in a monastery, and they were looking at the way that when they copy the manuscripts, mistakes get copied into the manuscripts. So this Greek monk, he thought he'd go down into the cellars and he would check the original manuscripts. And he didn't come back, and his brothers were worried about him. So they went down and found him, and he was sitting there crying. And they said to him, why are you crying? And he said, I found the original manuscript. 
God told us to celebrate, not celibate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I couldn't resist my little joke. <laughs> Pandit will be appearing all week at the uh, Bangkok Podcast Cabaret. Bring your guests. <laughs> Two drink minimum. Yeah, but that means that the teachings were are probably pretty close to pristine. Uh, pretty close not, to what was originally yeah. written down or, yeah. or spoken. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah. And of course, ch chanting doesn't um, get damaged by fire or flood, etc. The teachings are only written down when there weren't enough monks left to keep up with the chanting. The only weakness that I can think of is in, is in, in something like a massive war, when one side gets completely wiped out, then so does all of the knowledge of those chants. And then they're completely gone. Sure, but I mean, you never wipe out an entirety of a population, right? And People the point tried. is, if you've done it chanting, it's holographic, that each person then has a copy of the whole thing. So it's pretty good and accurate method of record. Because all it would take is one person to retain it. Right. And that one person could start teaching others again. Right. Yeah. Well, what happened was actually a thousand years after the Buddha, and when there weren't enough monks, uh, they were actually systematized back into Pali and written down. And this is the canon that we have now. Is there more benefit to chanting than just keeping records? Is, is it it's part of meditation? It is part of meditation, but the big advantage is the teaching is very much there, alive within you, rather than being in a book. And secondly, because different people learn different chants, you come together frequently and you recite your part of the scriptures and then you listen to somebody else's part of the scriptures. So it's a very effective way of maintaining a community that will come together and, and practice, recite, and listen to the teachings. Keeps it much more alive than being in a book where only a scholar can read it. Mm. That's very interesting because that flies uh, in the face of really Christian teachings. I mean, back in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to talk to God, you had to go to the church because conversations with God were done in Latin and the only people that could speak Latin were the well, priests. Oh, you go to heaven. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you skip over the middleman. But when, um, I forget the guy's name. Jesus? I'm not sure. No, 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 no. Jesus? <laughs> I remember that guy. The guy came out with the first English language Bible. Whoever he was, the church did not like him because he put the power to converse with God into the hands of the people. And that was the first big breaking down of the barrier between God and regular folk. But with, with what you're saying, it's interesting that all this sort of ways to live your life and the religion or philosophy, whatever you call it, was got its strength from being in the hands of the people. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, are there any parts of the teachings or, or do you call it scripture? I don't know. What teachings scriptures or scripture or that you disagree with? There's parts that are hard to understand. But I'm not sure about disagreeing with. Because I always wonder, like, how, how do Christians, what do they do? Do they, if they, if there's parts of the Bible that they just disagree with or parts that contradict themselves within the Bible, as there's many. Yeah, how the, do they deal with the that? Scriptures were pretty straightforward and they're very mechanical and consistent. So it's not a case of agreeing or disagreeing with them. Really, it's a case of investigating them. So there are certain areas of the scriptures which are not relevant. Whether then you disagree with that or not is another question, but there's certainly areas that are not relevant, and there's areas that you don't know. For example, you talk about heavens and hells, but unless you have psychic powers and you can see them, you don't actually know. So usually we have the position of rather than adopting a view or an opinion, or a party line, we adopt the view of don't know. Are there Davis? Well, I don't know. I can tell you this book said that, or this person says this, but I don't know. Uh, is there life after death? Is there enlightenment? Are we just a ball of self-replicating DNA? Well, I don't know. You, you just mentioned heaven and hell. What's Buddhism's teachings on how people go to heaven and why some people go to hell? Christian, it's what? I don't know, actually. Well, first of all, it, we guy. have to ask what heavens and hells are, and these are layers of the universe which are non-material either non-material or fine material, which means they're not physical bodies. So within these realms you have all kinds of layers of astral beings and devas and gods uh, and people in hell realms also. The point is that the whole of this is governed by naturalistic law. So natural laws will control the, the whole of the heavens and hell. There isn't a god that's outside making up the rules. 
in Christian yeah, Christianity, that's what they believe, right? Is that yeah, but God? Also, the the heaven is permanent, and the hell they have a purgatory, which is a temporary. But the hells are also permanent. In Buddhism, nothing is permanent. Even if you're born as the highest god, eventually you'll die and you'll be reborn in a different realm. Even if you're born in the lowest hell realm or outside of the samsara altogether, eventually you will still come back and be reborn again. So there's nothing that's permanent and there's nothing that's outside of the natural laws. Now what takes you up and what takes you down is the way that you live. And the Buddha had a big problem with this, that in those days you were holy because you were a Brahmin. And if you could trace your parents back seven generations of purely Aryan Brahmin stock, then you are a holy being. If you were born to an unholy family, then you were unholy. And he had a lot of difficulty trying to break people out of this way of thinking. Another way of thinking was that you could cleanse yourself by bathing in this river or that river or by torturing yourself or starving yourself or these ones, the, the swallow rolled up ribbons down into your stomach and then you pull it back up through your throat to cleanse your throat pipes and things like this. Ouch. Ascetic practices, we could say. Some groups would walk around on all fours like dogs. Uh, others wouldn't use clothes. Others would never eat cooked food, etc., etc. He had many, many different kinds of this. And all thinking that this was holy behavior. And the Buddha had a lot of problem trying to convince people the only thing that matters is the way that you behave. If you behave in a pure, good and kindly way that is uh, keeping precepts and living in a moral way, then this lifts you up. If you're behaving in a bad way, then this pulls you down. What, what's the difference, though, between bad and good? Who determines that? There isn't a... The, <laughs> you keep coming back to this, who, who determines, who's the decider? Well, I, to me, it's always like... A decider. We know. <laughs> it's always It's always perception. Someone who robs a 7-Eleven to feed his family and gives that money to a monk, is that a good person or a bad person? Hmm. So to me, it's all perception. Is, is that If you rob a 7-Eleven, are you bad? But what if you're using that money, you need it, what if you go buy a stereo with it? What if you go buy a car? What's the difference between using that money to buy a stereo or using that money to buy food? Well, it's like the people that catch the birds and sell them to you for a release. Wouldn't it be good to just really not just catch release. them in the first place? Right. You know, uh, so you <laughs> said, you know, th that if you live a good moral life or, or not good moral life, who determines that, isn't it? What if you're a completely terrible person, you murder lots of people, but you think, hey, you know what? I think I did a pretty good job at that. <laughs> It doesn't really matter too much what you think about it. It's, it's really the case of the actions that you do. Now, you put, think of it this way. To a meditator, we look at our own self inwardly. We look at our own being. So when you do meditation, you turn your, ga your gaze inwards and you look at the state of your body and the mind. When you do that, you start to see that if you've been doing a certain thing during the day, your mind will be one way when you stop and look at it in meditation. If you've been doing something else during the day, it's a different way of meditation. So you can see that if we were to sit around here and we would meditate and you'd follow the guidelines, after a while you feel your mind gets lighter and brighter. If, however, we go out and we rob a 7-Eleven store, when we come back here, if you were to try and sit and look in your mind, you couldn't because you'd be too agitated. So you can see that some activities will be tending to purify and lighten your consciousness. Some activities will be sending to darken or stir up or excite consciousness. And so this is the pull. The more pure you make it, then the more you're, you're adding to the rising up factor. Another thing is you don't think of somebody as good or bad. You think of an action as good or bad. So you can quite happily think of somebody's one action of stealing the money as bad, but another action of giving it to a poor person or a beggar as being good. It very much depends on the motivations. If you're giving to a beggar on the street because you want to try and cleanse yourself of your own guilt, then this probably is not going to be a very uplifting action. I wonder if there had never been any religion, if religion had not developed, if eventually just regular human compassion and conception of the world around them and would have aligned themselves as good or bad. Like, I'm not religious, but I think I'm a good person. I mean, I don't kill someone, not because I'm afraid of going to hell, just because I think it's a crappy thing to do. And I think a, a, a normal, nice human doesn't react that way. A good human doesn't do that. And that's not out of any religious thing. 
Now, imagine that you did kill somebody. What kind of states of mind would that generate? I don't know. Get back to me after I've uh, <laughs> but there are, flown there off the handle. people who could kill someone, and they would be no problem with it. They wouldn't be agitated. And they're psychotic. <laughs> right. right. Well, or, or say some dude killed my whole family, and then I just went crazy and killed him. I, I, I don't know. This is all But that was the obviously. point. You said you went crazy, and going crazy isn't the purification of consciousness. Whereas if you forgave that person, you would feel, if you looked inwardly, a purification of consciousness. So then you start to see the difference between your actions pulling you in what direction. I have a question for you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm scared. If a woman goes to a funeral and she meets a man and she likes him, she wants to get his number and they get along very well, but at the end of the funeral they kind of left separately and she didn't get a chance to get his number off him. So a week later, she killed her sister. Why? Well, this is one of those questions. Because her sister was married to the guy? No. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go right ahead and say that I, I suck at these kind of puzzles. <laughs> we'll be here all night if you want. <laughs> okay, she wanted yeah. another funeral so she could meet the guy. Oh. Again. Oh. Right. But the point is that this is one of the questions psychologists will ask you to see if you're psychotic or not. <laughs> oh, God. And if you're psychotic, you're very likely to get the answer. So anybody who's listening out there right now who got the answer to that, <laughs> yeah. uh, Check husbands yourself or wives of that person, you should <laughs> start to reassess your Someone's listening. Well, obviously, because any sane person would just kill again. <laughs> Uh, oh, but God. genuinely, that's these kind of questions psychologists ask people to see if they have this innate sense of right and wrong. And practically everybody does. And there's one quote of a man who said, I spent my whole life looking after people and giving people the lighter pleasures of this world. And this is how they reward me. They vilify me and they throw me in prison. You any idea who said that? Hitler. Uh, no, <laughs> this is Al Capone. The point being that he did, you know, he obviously killed a lot of people and he was a gangster, but he justified it because he still wanted to be a good person. So a true psychotic is actually very rare. Somebody who actually doesn't have any kind of feeling or understanding that other people feel things uh, is actually very, very rare. Now, what kind of karma they would receive for their actions then, I couldn't tell you. The point is that most people do have a feeling about their own actions. And the way that you act starts to build your psyche. I met a girl as part of my psychology degree, a young girl, and she runs a old people's home. And I said to her, because we were supposed to ask questions, I said, what is the one thing that you've learned from running this people's home? And she said, you can look at these old people and you really, really see how they live their lives. Because some of them are very compassionate and helping towards the others. Some of them are very demanding. Some of them are very bossy. And she says, however it is that you've lived your life, when you're older, all these characteristics become magnified. And so I really took that. I can see that as being true and real. And this is how karma is working. It's your actions that are determining what kind of person you're going to turn into. Can, can you talk a little bit more about karma? What your, your thoughts on it? Is this something that people have? Can they lose it? Lose it? Can they you get, lose your karma? Did they get... <laughs> like Austin Powers lost his mojo. Right. You know, like, <laughs> do you get bad karma? Like, I always think that when some people say, like, if I do this, I'm going to get good karma or I'm going to get bad karma. My theory is it's, it's neither. It, it's, it's whatever you think that you're going to get. If you if you think you're gonna steal this car, you think that's a, that's gonna cause you bad luck or something. It does because you think it. Possibly, and there's a, a view in Russia right now. If you do something without any emotion attached to it, you won't receive any karma from that. You remain neutral. Yeah. So if you if you can kill somebody, but you can kill them completely neutrally emotionally, then you'll receive no repercussions from that. Just kind of walk away saying, "Hey, what are you gonna do?" In a Russian accent. In a Russian accent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just put ski on the end of it. And I think, what are you going to do? Is that Transylvania? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but the karma is a whole other episode. We can talk a lot about karma. Now, the, the big question is then, I talked about the spiritual, how refined your spiritual nature is, is determined by what you do. And then this rises you up to higher realms or lower realms after you die. That was the basic mechanism. His one analogy was, if you have a pot 
and you fill the pot with stones when you throw it into a lake and it reaches the bottom and the pot cracks where do the stones go they'll stay on the bottom of the lake if you fill a pot with butter and it, you throw it into the lake and the pot cracks the butter will rise to the surface of the lake and so this was the analogy is the way that you've lived your life you will float to your natural level so there's no body who is deciding there is no no god or no judge who is weighing things up it's just a case of how refined your being is mm. now all of this heavens and hells and the refining of your being this is kind of against the common view of the world at the moment which is a purely mechanistic materialistic outlook of the world all we are is a bundle of physical cells a dna self-replicating cell or, or being this is the materialistic view and this is what the buddhism is actually opposed to and so buddhism's view is is what is aside from the materialistic part of the universe there's also the spiritual or the non-physical or the mental you might say or the consciousness side of it which involves heavens hells it involves karma it involves purification and it has a whole set of laws and rules outside of the normal rules for physical matter physical matter is only one small part of the being so the common view these days is that we've evolved from something that slithered out of the oceans some of us not much since then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. You said that, that, that Buddhism generally rejects materialism, but, but earlier you were talking about the new Dell computer and how awesome that is, the new super thin one. Where do you draw the line between wanting that awesome new computer and, and, and stepping over into where materialism starts? It was a Samsung, actually. But oh, well, that's okay then. <laughs> <laughs> no, materialism in, in terms of wanting material things, that's different. We're talking about the materialistic philosophy, the, which means everything in the universe is purely a case of physical matter. Right. So there are two kinds of uh, materialistic outview. One is everything is physical matter, anything else is an illusion. Another view is everything is physical matter, but some physical matter put together working in the right way produces mental states and produces emotional qualities. And these emotional qualities and mental states have their own rules. And this is called functionalism, functionalist materialism. Because all the mental side still depends purely upon the physical workings of the, the being. Uh, there are a lot of problems with that outlook. One is e evolution. Uh, we have to have evolved very slowly from these beings, from you know these animals that slithered out of the oceans. And there are a lot of problems with evolution theory. Well, let me just say that that's a big thing in the States right now, the, the battle between religion and science and evolution and religion. And how does Buddhism see that? Within Buddhism, like evolution is fine. That's a working in the materialistic universe. The point is that's not all there is. It's not just purely materialistic universe. In a materialistic universe, for example, if you rob a bank, that is because your neurons are wired in a certain way and they've made you do it. But if you go to a judge and you say, sorry, your honor, for robbing the bank, my free will forced me to do it, you're not going to get let off. We have an assumption that we're not simply a case of molecules being put together in a physical way. We have freedom, we have free choice, uh, and it's real, it's not an illusion. So there are a lot of problems with just the, the purely materialistic universe, but that tends to be the scientific view of the world at the moment, a purely materialistic, right. mechan we could say a mechanistic universe. Okay. Have you ever seen that YouTube video of that insect, parasite or something, that controls ants i think it's ants oh that's a fungus yeah yeah and then yeah, it forces yeah. them to go into the water and it drowns and it comes out of their head yeah and it can make them walk up blades of grass right yeah. right yeah. and you can do this with humans too this is what's called the god helmet and if you put this helmet on it uses powerful magnets to disable certain areas of your frontal cortex and it's perfectly safe what right? are you serious yes you look it up on the internet, the God Helmet, it's called. Sounds like an awesome metal band. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what Magneto wears? <laughs> and they put people in this thing with sensory deprivation, blocking off their eyes, feeding them certain sounds, and they will report things like out-of-body experiences, they'll report feeling there's somebody else in the room with them, they'll report feelings of connections with the universe, 
So we can also manipulate people's brains directly to be able to do this. We can also plant electrodes into people's brains and change the way that they behave or change what they experience. Godhelmet refers to an experimental apparatus used in the field of neurotheology. The apparatus placed on the head of an experimental subject generates fluctuating magnetic fields, and many of your subjects have reported mystical experiences and altered states. I love that wow. neural theology. Yeah. Neural theology. <laughs> I've never even heard that before. That's awesome. The God Helmet came to public attention when Prop Pandit went on the Bangkok podcast. No way. <laughs> when it appeared in several TV documentaries showing it in use. Right. So we know that you can actually be manipulate human behavior by manipulating the physical side of things. However, we still have this assumption and this belief and this understanding that we have a free will, we have mind. And this runs by a mechanism that's not purely determined by the way our neurons are wired together. Which means we have free choice, we have free will. Now within Buddhism, the mechanistic view is okay, the evolution is okay, there's no reason why beings can't be evolved from you know, very low creatures and evolved through mammals and insects and birds and etc. But that's not the whole story, there's also the mental side. It seems to me that Buddhism as a philosophy is, was arranged in such a way that was very, very smart because it, it seems to me that there's no absolutes. For instance, I mean, the, the only other religion I have experience with is Christianity because I was raised when I was young as a Christian. And I know that the church throughout history has been very resistant to new ideas as science has proposed. I mean, whether it was Galileo saying the earth is not the center of the universe, they locked his locked him up and threw away the key for the rest of his life. Whether it's Charles Darwin saying people evolve or, or animals evolve, humans evolve. But it seems that Buddhism is very open to new ideas. And if science proposed something new that maybe has has been accepted as as truth uh, for a long time, that suddenly maybe not as solid as it once was, Buddhism is kind of really cool at going, hey, yeah, probably, sure, why not? <laughs> you know, it is. But I would also say that the. Christianity and uh, Islam has also been very science friendly over the generations. Really, uh, Darwin was a was certainly a Christian, and he saw absolutely no conflict when he set out on his travels. On the Beagle, you know, most of science was actually driven from Christianity. And what they thought was they were investigating God's world, and there was nothing wrong with that. The dichotomy or the two camps being opposed, I think, is a very new thing. I mean, you raised Galileo, but I think in general, the idea that science and religion are opposed is a very new thing that's come up in the last 60 years, probably. The Islamic, you know, through the Dark Ages, it's the Islamic cultures that furthered all the science. They furthered architecture, microscopes, the investigation of the natural world. Their, their libraries were vast, vast libraries, far vaster than anything we have today. You said that the, um, the material side of evolution is okay for Buddhist beliefs, but you feel that's not the only part of us. Who's doing the research on the other part, the spiritual side, the soul? Who's You've got talking the problem, about this research into the spiritual side, and the Buddha was fairly scientific in that he said you don't believe people, you don't believe tradition, you don't just believe because of your teacher, you have to pick something up, look at it yourself, investigate it, and find out whether it's true. And he said the same for his own teachings. He told people not to believe them. Uh, you should investigate it and see if it's true. The problem is that when you investigate spiritual teachings, it's always turning the view inwards. So it's very hard to replicate in an external experiment. The truths or the things that you, you discover, then it's hard to replicate in an experiment to give like as an external truth. But certainly, internally, each person is able and to turn their attention inwards and do the investigation, do the work, do the meditation, and make their own discoveries. We, we touched on that briefly on our first show. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. What can people do who maybe are new to Buddhism, uh, don't know much about it, what can they do to look inward and reflect on themselves? Well, that's what meditation is about. So you pick up a meditation practice, and there are many different styles and types. Find one that suits you and, and practice it. And meditation is what? Is it just sitting in a quiet room, chanting, <laughs> thinking about something? 
Do they put their drapes around them? or? It depends on the method. You basically have two methods. One is to calm the mind down. And for that, you would pick up a meditation object and concentrate your mind on it. So you might concentrate the mind onto breathing. That's the usual one. So forget about everything else. Just watch the breath in and out, in and out. And the mind changes quite quickly when you do this. If you put the mind onto something that excites you, pretty quickly you get a physiological response and your body gets excited and happy. If we put you on a lie detector and we tell you to think about your favorite food, if you're hungry, your galvanic skin response will change pretty much instantly. Whatever you put your mind on, pretty quickly your body and your thoughts will start to follow that thing. So if you put your mind onto something that's neutral and calm, after a while you start to feel quite spaced out and quite calm. There are many different concentration objects, breath, uh, a mantra or a sound uh, or a feeling in the body, different kinds of objects. The second kind of meditation is investigation. So you actually investigate how does the mind work, how does the body work, how does clinging work, how does attachment work, where is my self, etc. And you start to follow these kinds of questions and you use them as an internal investigation. So in Buddhism we do both these styles. They're called samatha and vipassana, or concentration and insight meditation. You mentioned uh, before the show, I don't know if we have time to talk about that, but I'm curious, you mentioned before the show that Buddhism doesn't believe in a soul? Yes, correct. Can you explain about that a little bit? Because I think most people, religious or not, would like to believe in a soul that we have a, a soul inside of us it's you know your soul mate and all these other fancy but terms, it's not but so much a soul as in as like a personal identity it's more of like a, a piece of the universe right first thing is don't be so hooked on your beliefs very often especially philosophy religion people are really interested in what what do you believe it's much more important to ask what do you know and you can believe in all kinds of things and people will, what was that thing you put two Jews in a room and you get three opinions and <laughs> it, does, it doesn't just apply to Jews it applies to everybody right? so the beliefs are not really to be trusted I mean do you think your beliefs are right your beliefs on heaven on hell on death on rebirth on tsunamis and earthquakes I mean your beliefs are really just a shortcut so that you don't have to think about things too much. I you hate decide, thinking about things too much. I believe in this, so I'm going to act according to that belief. And so I wouldn't put too much stock in beliefs, personally. Now, whether you have a soul or not, the teaching in Buddhism, you could say is like a who am I question. So you want to find out what is yourself. That's the question. It's not a case of believing that there is or there isn't, or it's like this or it's not like that. It's a case of questioning, so it turns your attention inwards. Doctrinally, by self, what is meant is an Atman. And an Atman is a permanent, unchanging spark, soul, self, something like that. This thing can't change, it's always the same. This Atman then is what gets reborn from lifetime to lifetime. That in Buddhism was said was not the case. They said there isn't this permanent, unchanging self. However, a self that does change, that's perfectly okay. Now, what is a soul? Does a soul change or not? Does a soul grow? Does a soul get better or does it get worse? Does it learn? If it does, then why not? You can have that kind of soul. But a permanent, unchanging soul is not the case in Buddhism. Before the show, you also mentioned that you don't believe in global warming, which I think is a whole other episode. Maybe we'll get to that another time. Wait, I just want to go, go back to that. What do you believe? What is your belief then about evolution? The evolution has occurred. That is to say, species have changed into other species. And we can prove this as a, the most famous, probably the, the giraffe and the Archaeopteryx are the most famous um, points of discussion. That's the feathered fossil that they found, right? Archaeopteryx, if I can, if I can remember how to say it correctly, was a something between a bird and a lizard. And the idea that birds have developed from lizards, and we can see this is probably true because, as an embryo, birds develop teeth, but by the time they've hatched, they don't have teeth. 
Birds also develop claws on the ends of their fingers, but by the time they're hatched, most birds don't have claws. Actually, a few of them do, and they can actually climb trees with their wings. They also have a, if you think of a lizard, the back legs go straight back. But if you think of a bird, the back legs come underneath them so they can stand on two legs. This is called a rotated pelvis. And if you look at the way birds develop in an egg, uh, after a certain period in the gestation period, their pelvises will actually rotate from the lizard stance to the bird stance. So by things like this, we can see there is a definite connection between animals. So there has been evolution from one species into another species. However, the mechanics of that are not proven. And this is what the Darwinist, or actually Darwinism was proved to be false natural selection. You now have the neo-Darwinist theory. But even when the, within this theory, there are a lot of different views and a lot of different angles. So there's a lot of question around it. How it actually works is an interesting question. But one theory I did find very interesting was all creatures when they're young, they have accelerated learning. So babies, you know, young children can learn 10 languages very quickly and easily. Whereas people have been here for 10 years and can't even speak Thai. What, uh, <laughs> what's suddenly going on here? Why am I getting all the attention all of a sudden? <laughs> Actually, I think you just uh, gave me a good out. Uh, I don't have the capacity for accelerated learning anymore. Yeah, you're not evolving, you see. <laughs> Clearly not. I'm, in fact, devolving, maybe. <laughs> now, if you imagine a young creature, uh, like a young monkey, has accelerated capacity for learning, and then as it gets older, its mind becomes kind of cemented and set in its ways. One theory is that human beings are actually immature monkeys, and this is why we're not as strong as monkeys are, why we're not as hairy as monkeys are. We are monkeys who got trapped in the learning phase of youth. We're immature monkeys, we didn't mature correctly. And because we're trapped in the learning phase, this means that we can learn throughout our whole lives. And this is what makes us so brainy and clever and makes us make atom bombs and things like that because we're so much cleverer than monkeys. There's actually a... a Mind equals blown. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of theory about this, neuroplasticity. And a lot of the experiments, not done with humans, of course, but if you interrupt the development of the neurons in a young animal, what they do is the, the other neurons that are there start to develop into the necessary brain structures. And this is called neuroplasticity. And the brain is incredibly adaptable within the first one year of its life. And we're counting one year from the time that it's in the womb. Now, scientists have been actually trying to replicate that and it actually depends upon the chemical environment of the brain. And if we can replicate that, that means that we can start to repair brain damage and things like that. It's quite exciting. Like stem cells for the yeah. brain. I wonder if that, that rapid learning is, is part of human evolution. Because when we come out, we're practically useless. We are useless. If we didn't have the capacity to learn very quickly, we right. would be food for other animals and humans wouldn't have survived. Like when a horse is born, they can, they they can, can walk run. within a few hours. Right. You know? Yeah, like a, a giraffes are born, they can, they can walk very quickly. Yeah. Yet humans take years. I still sometimes trip, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I uh, feel I got a headache again. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, yeah, I think we're very well within our rights to call Prapanda the Buddhist Jedi. The Buddhist Jedi. The Buddhist Jedi. <laughs> Not to mention nuclear power and evolution and science and all things. Now, I yeah. can tell you, George was... Lucas was a close friend of Joseph Campbell, and he was the world's expert on storytelling, which we mentioned earlier, and the archetypes on, on Jung's archetype. And so George Lucas took all of the classic archetypes from stories, and put them into Star Wars. So when he was gave the Jedi Knights, this was actually comes from the word Jedi, that we have many Jedis in Thailand. So he copied all these, the evil lord, the innocent hero, the damsel in distress. Well, he remade the, the Kurosawa movie, the, uh, the Hidden Fortress. This, this particular story has been told for countless generations in countless forms. He also lifted it from a, a lot of different um, religions, languages, cultures. My Dutch friends all say, yeah, the fact that Darth Vader was Luke's dad wasn't a big deal. It wasn't really a big surprise for us because father in Dutch is, is vader. Right. V-A-D-E-R. So they're like, oh, yeah, well, we saw that coming. <laughs>
George <laughs> Lucas is a hack, man. I'm telling you. See, that's what happened with the later series. He ran out of religions to copy. And yeah, yeah. Had to come up with something original. <laughs> that was where he ran into a brick wall. Um, well, if you want to learn more about Darth Vader, nuclear power, evolution, monkeys, birds, feathers. And Star Wars. And Star Wars. Go to university. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, once again, thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Okay. Nice to be here. Great. Great.